The input-output characteristics of a linear time invariant system can also be described in terms of something known as the impulse response. The basic idea behind use of the impulse response, as well as frequency response and system or transfer function, is to characterize the output of a linear time invariant system using a canonical form of input or a special input. Now, if we can write then an arbitrary input as a weighted sum of time shifted versions of these special or canonical inputs, then because of linearity and time invariance, the output is the exact same weighted sum of time shifted outputs corresponding to the canonical input. Now that's a bit abstract, let's make it more concrete. So we're gonna use the impulse response as our canonical input for this particular lecture. And it turns out that we can write an arbitrary signal as a weighted sum of shifted impulses. I'm just putting the amplitude of the signal at that corresponding shift location. Now, if I apply an impulse to a system, then I'm gonna get the impulse response as my output. And once I know how the system reacts to this single impulse, I can determine how the system reacts to an arbitrary input because I'll have that arbitrary input described as a weighted sum of delayed impulses, and that implies the output is a weighted sum of delayed impulse responses. Now, one way to write this is as shown here. I have an input x of n and an output y of n, and then the output y of n can be expressed as the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of h of k times x of n minus k. And this operation here, this infinite sum, is known as the convolution sum. And we can denote that as an operator form using an asterisk between two signals. That means that we're writing h of n convolved with x of n, and that implies this particular form for the summation. So this describes the output in terms of the input x of n and the impulse response h of n. Now this expression for the convolution sum expressing the output in terms of the impulse response and the input lets us see certain properties of the system in terms of the impulse response. First we're going to look at causality what it means for a system to be causal. Well, I can write out this infinite sum and we'll just keep some of the terms near k equals zero. So I'll start with h of minus two, x of n plus two, plus h of minus one, x of n plus one, plus h of zero, x of n, plus h of one, x of n minus one, and so on. Now recall that for a system to be causal, the output at time n can only depend on the input at time n and previous times. So the output at time n, y of n, cannot depend on a future value of the input. So x of n minus two here is a future value of the input, as is x of n plus one, and as all are the other inputs that are involved in the dot, dot, dot to the left here. But once we get to h of zero, x of n, now I've got y of n defined in terms of the present value of x of n, and then we have h of one x of n minus one, which involves a past value of x of n, and so on. So all these dot dot dots to the right involve past values of the input. So causality, it means that none of these terms can be present. These have to drop out because if any of these are present, then the output at time n depends on a future value of the input. So if h of n is equal to zero for n less than zero, then all these terms go away and we have a causal system. And that makes sense on another level too, because h of n is the response of the system to an impulse input. And we can't have an output before the impulse turns on at time zero. So the system can only react to the input if it's causal, and therefore the output can only begin once the impulse arrives, which is at time n equals zero. Now another property that follows from this convolution expression for the relationship between the input and the output is something called a finite impulse response system. We'll talk later about finite impulse response filters.
And finite impulse response means that the impulse response only lasts for a finite duration. So the number of non-zero elements in H of n has to be finite. Oftentimes, finite impulse response systems can be written in the form h of n equals 0 for n less than 0 or n greater than or equal to some capital N. Now we can see that when I write y of n as a sum from k equals 0 now to capital N minus 1, because those are the only non-zero values of h of n, of h of n, x of n minus k, so in this form, we see that we can write the output as a finite sum involving past values of the input. And specifically, we have a total of capital N values that we need to sum up. We can give a very specific example of this. If I take the average of the two most recent inputs and call that Y of N, then that would correspond to a system whose impulse response at time 0 and time 1 are equal to 1 half, and it's 0 for all other times. Now, in contrast to the finite impulse response case, the infinite impulse response system has an impulse response that lasts forever. Okay, so there's an infinite number of non-zero values. We come up with an example. Suppose we have a causal system so that the impulse response is zero prior to time zero, but then thereafter it's one half to the n. Now this system has an impulse response that decays toward zero, but it never exactly goes to zero, so we call this an infinite impulse response system. Now if this is truly infinite, then the convolution sum has an infinite number of terms to add up, and you can see that we can't actually compute that using a computer if the system then is IIR. Now we can still implement IIR systems, but to do that, we're going to use a difference equation to obtain the output as a function of the input. For example, if I write the difference equation in the form y of n is equal to negative sum k equals 1 to capital N of a k y of n minus k plus k equals 0 to m b k x of n minus k, in this form, we can compute the output even though the impulse response of the system is infinite. And if you look at this particular difference equation representation and you think about using it to compute the impulse response of the system, we can do that by setting x of n to be equal to delta of n as an input. And what you see is that if the ak's are all zero, then after m time steps, this impulse washes out of the system and the, and the output becomes exactly zero. So the impulse response is finite duration. It would be length capital M in that case. So if the AKs are all zero, then we have an FIR system. Now it turns out that if one of the AKs is non-zero, then we get a recursive situation where the present value of the impulse response depends on a past value. And that's in general when you're going to have an infinite impulse response system. But we can compute those without doing the infinite number of computations in the convolution sum by using this recursive form. So let's find the impulse response for a system described by a difference equation. We'll assume that y of n is 1 half y of n minus 1 plus x of n. To find the impulse response, we're going to replace x of n with delta of n, and now our difference equation becomes h of n equals 1 half h of n minus 1 plus delta of n. Because of course we defined h of n to be the output when the input is an impulse. So if the system is causal, we'll assume then that h of n is equal to 0 for n less than 0. And we can just go through this recursion where we say that h of 0 is 1 half h of minus 1 plus 1, so that's 1. And then h of 1 is 1 half h of 0 plus, well, the delta of n term is now 0, so that's going to be 1 half. And then since the delta of n term is always 0 for n greater than 0, we end up with h of n equals 1 half h of n minus 1. And the formula that we get for the impulse response takes the general pattern h of n is 1 half to the n for n greater than or equal to 0. So clearly, again, this is recursive, and this is an IR system because this relationship between the present being dependent on the past never exactly dies out. We're going to look at some other examples from the systems that we introduced in the differential equations description lecture. Specifically, we'll start off with y of n equals 1 sixth time the average of the six most recent inputs.
And in this case, if we put x of n equals delta of n, we find that we get 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 times 1 sixth for the impulse response. If I assume that I have the different system where I have 1 sixth x of n minus x of n minus 1 plus x of n minus 2 minus x of n minus 3 plus x of n minus 4 minus x of n plus 5, then the impulse response just alternates between plus 1 sixth and minus 1 sixth for those six terms that are involved here. And we can consider the two recursive systems, the recursive low pass system that we looked at before, where y of n was 0.95 y of n minus one plus 0.05 x of n. If I look at the impulse response of this system, you see it's decaying exponential and it decays as 0.95 to the n because each new value is 0.95 times the previous one. In contrast, when I have a minus 0.95 in the recursive term here, then the sign flips. Okay, it starts out when n is equal to 0 for h of 0, I get 0 0.05 because this is going to be 1 and everything else is 0. And then thereafter, it goes negative 0.95 times the previous value. So we're just going to alternate sign and decay according to 0.95 to the n. Another important property that should be mentioned in the context of the impulse response is what happens when you have a cascade of systems. Well, if these systems are linear and time invariant, then it turns out that it doesn't matter which order you place them in. So if I have a system with impulse response h1 of n, followed by a system with impulse response h2 of n, that's equivalent to having a system with impulse response h2 of n, followed by a system with impulse response h1 of n. The relationship between the input x of n and the output y of n is identical whether you interchange the system. And this is a consequence of the convolution property. Now it turns out when I have a cascade of systems, the impulse response of the cascade is the convolution of the impulse responses of the individual systems. We have x of n relates to y of n through an impulse response given by h1 of n convolved with h2 of n. Because we can interchange the order and not affect anything, that says that we can also relate x of n to y of n as h2 convolved with h1. And we see that convolution has a commutative property that I can interchange the order. Now here I've written it in terms of convolving impulse responses but it works just as well for convolving the input with the impulse response. So if I have input x of n, I convolve that with the system impulse response h of n, that's the same as doing the convolution in the other order. And that particular property sometimes plays a role in simplifying analytical evaluation of convolution. But its bigger consequence is to do with the fact that we can interchange the order of linear time invariant systems without affecting the overall input-output characteristic. The impulse response can also be used to describe the relationship between the input and the output of continuous time systems. So in this case, we apply a continuous time impulse, a Dirac delta function, to the input of the system, and we see what the output is, and we'll call the impulse response h of t, well, if we do that, then when we apply an arbitrary input x of t to the system, the output y of t is the integral from minus infinity to infinity h of tau x of t minus tau d tau. This is called the convolution integral as opposed to the convolution sum for the discrete time case. It looks very similar in that we denote the convolution integral using an asterisk just as we do for denoting the convolution sum with discrete time signals. Now in this case, the impulse response is a mathematical model for the response of the system to an impulse. Now impulses don't really physically exist because they have infinite height and zero width such that the area under them is unity. And we can't really build a signal like that. But we can view it as a mathematical approximation to a very large amplitude short duration input. So this is a transient response of the system to an idealized large amplitude short duration input. 
And as such then, the impulse response and the convolution integral are of value primarily for analysis of continuous time systems. This is not really a computational tool or even an experimental tool, but it does provide a useful tool for analysis. And conceptually, it allows us to view continuous and discrete time systems in a very similar framework where we have an impulse response that describes the relationship between the input and output for an arbitrary signal through either the convolution sum or convolution integral.